Hello, everyone. Thank you all for zooming in to listen to our two exhibiting artists, Jenny Blazing and Karen, Karen Walsh, speak about Turning Point. This exhibition, Turning Point, is held in the Frankie G. Weems Gallery, which is located in the Gaddy Hamrick Art Center. This exhibition is on view until October 1st. Um, I forgot to introduce myself. For those who don't know me, my name is Molly Hull, and I am the gallery director of Meredith Art Galleries. Um, a couple of etiquette things to keep in mind. We encourage you to turn on your camera. We love to see your pretty faces, um, but please keep your video or your, sorry, your microphones muted um, so we can listen to the artists. Um, you are welcome to ask questions throughout the presentation. We just ask that you type them in the chat, which I will be actively manning. Um, otherwise, there will be a Q&A session at the end. So without further ado, I turn it over to Jenny Blazing. Hi, everyone. Um, I want, I'm Jenny, and I want to thank you so much for joining us this evening. Um, I have to let you know I've got some notes because I'm going to be covering a lot of specifics and I don't have everything absolutely memorized, um, but I'm so looking forward to sharing this time with you. Um, I'm a painter. I'm also a found object sculptor and an installation artist. And my collaborator, Karen Walsh, um, will be giving this talk with me. Karen, would you like to introduce yourself? Hey, everyone. Again, it's super fun to be here. Um, so nice to see some faces I don't see that often and other faces that are new to me. But um, anyway, so I am the other half of this exhibit. I am a painter, illustrator, animator, and video artist. And um, it is a pleasure to be part of this. And thank you again, Molly. So, yes, thank uh, you, Molly. <laughs> So throughout this talk, Karen and I are each gonna be covering different aspects of the exhibit and we'll be alternating between the two of us. Um, we named this exhibit Turning Point and we gave that quite a bit of thought, but the reason we named it that is we wanted our, our main purpose to be to convince viewers that now is the time for action. Um, for decades, climate change researchers have been telling us that we needed to act but at least in the United States, it was really convenient for, for us and for the media and for policymakers to dismiss these warnings as maybe anomalies or inflated projections. Um, we could easily think that maybe it was something our grandchildren would need to deal with. Um, but today we're really at a turning point. It's a moment when we need to act in support of solutions because factors right now are aligned at this key time and we have to make a major difference. There are really, I see three aspects of this moment that loom largely. One is that whole fact that we can, as a society, we can't really ignore what's happening. It's really happening to us at this point. We're seeing record-breaking extreme weather, flooding, wildfires in California, um, drought in the Southeast, Southwest, sorry. Um, the flooding, of course, that we saw in New York, New Jersey, and New Orleans. And probably because of this, now nearly two-thirds of Americans believe that climate change is an urgent problem that we need to address. And at the same time, fortunately, um, sustainable energy is really becoming cost-effective. Uh, wind and solar have just plunged in cost so quickly that they're now the cheapest and cleanest sources of power. Uh, financial institutions are really moving toward investing in renewables, more so than fossil fuels, and that's both because of these financial reasons that are presenting themselves and also for environmental um, priorities. And then finally, politically, there's currently the potential to implement some really impactful climate-oriented solutions, and particularly at the federal level, we're seeing a couple of major infrastructure um, policies being proposed and discussed. And if we can support our politicians as they move forward with advancing these sorts of measures, we're going to be able to make major differences in this battle against climate change. So I'm gonna walk you briefly through our exhibit. 
Karen, next slide, please, I think. Mm -hmm. um, our show <laughs> features our Welsh Blazing immersive installation. It's called Changing Worlds Now. And Karen's gonna be telling you much more about that. But in addition, we have a total of three multimedia works. We've got 16 paintings, a found object sculpture, and interactive opportunities. You'll, if you visit the exhibit, you're gonna see that some of our works include QR codes that link you to opportunities to learn more about specific aspects of each piece. So many of our works contribute to this story about this important moment that we're facing as we're surrounded by news of all these natural disasters and how they're impacting vulnerable populations. Um, some are even cautionary works about what we might expect in the future if we fail to embrace climate solutions at this important turning point. But it was really important to us to also convey that there's a lot of hope around solving this. Um, we can avoid the worst impacts of climate change if we all act to support policies and measures to address it. Now you're gonna notice QR codes even on some of these slides in the lower left-hand corner of this one in particular, you'll see this. And it's, it's giving you an opportunity to delve deeper about the development of the exhibit in this case. But at the end of this entire talk, um, there will be a slide with all of the QR codes you're gonna see along the way that you can capture, you can screenshot them, and then you can just look at them at your leisure. Um, with all that said, I'm just gonna turn the discussion over to Karen. Okay, so since Changing Worlds Now is the featured work in this exhibit, we thought that might be the piece to start with. And I know, cause I know some of these faces on this call. So I know many of you have been to the exhibit um, and others have seen this work in other venues, um, but just to, I'm gonna give just a quick high level for those of you who have never seen it before. So here we're kind of looking at a, a split um, screen where on the left, you're seeing um, the work without projection on it. And on the right, you're seeing it with the projection on it. So Changing Worlds Now is a multimedia work that projects a six minute looping video onto a six foot by eight foot acrylic and collage mural. So a little context of size, that's six foot by eight foot that you're looking at there. And within the exhibit, um, Meredith has done an awesome job of sort of cordoning off a, a video projection space um, that works really well. So the projection and the mural have been crafted to work together. The motion was designed around the elements in the mural. Um, I will say Jenny is more of a painter than me and she is responsible for the mural and I am a video artist and I'm responsible for most of the audio and video. Um, the piece does have a complex soundscape and both the audio and the visuals have a lot of embedded symbolism and references. In fact, Durham residents um, should be able to pick out quite a few local landmarks. And the basis for how we constructed this messaging was after we had consulted with climate communication experts, two different ones from this state, um, and a climate scientist as well, but, but it was sort of putting into action some of the, um, what has been learned about the most effective climate communication methods, and it is not about polar bears. Uh, so Changing Worlds Now is meant to be like a past, present, future, multi-sensory storytelling experience, and it's essentially divided into three chapters. So on this slide, I've just captured like some moments in chapter one. And chapter one um, is driven really, the imagery is driven by the Judeo-Christian order of creation as described in the book of Genesis. Um, this chapter ends with the arrival of man. So you can kind of see that in the right uh, frame there. Um, so the arrival of man as like dominator and professed heir to Earth's bounty. Now, pre-pandemic, uh, there was an arts event um, in downtown Durham and a version of Changing Worlds had been projected in large scale onto the outside of 21C Museum Hotel. 
And uh, it was during this nighttime arts event. So the looping video and the audio was projected for about two hours. And I'll just do give a quick shout out to Cone Tech Systems who did like an amazing job with the audio and visuals that night. Um, so in our exhibit itself, we do have a large screen TV, which shows a one minute time lapsed video of that projection. And since I don't wanna like be taking time with showing videos during this, um, I did like embed just some snippets. So here's like a six second quick little time lapse of some of the imagery in chapter one. And it just loops again and again. I always like a video, so <laughs> it, it makes it maybe uh, makes my explanation make a little more sense when you can actually see a video. So chapter two, so when we transition to chapter two, we see the industrial revolution's rapid impact on society. And at this point, um, like ever expanding economies and unchecked development and fossil fuel dependencies, these have all become ways of life we have entered the Anthropocene. I'm sure that's a word that you're hearing a lot more now than you ever did before. So the Anthropocene is a time that we have entered, which is where um, human activities have impacted the environment enough to constitute a geological change. We are there. So the climate crisis becomes not only a threat to health and safety, but it has also been deemed the greatest threat to US national security. Um, so once again, I have like just a little moment that will loop from chapter one. That's the side of 21C you're seeing. It's all looking in fast motion because it's a time lapse. And then the final section, we, we don't usually call it chapters, but for tonight, we're calling it chapter three. So the final section lays bare this turning point at which we now find ourselves. So the effects of climate change are upon us. So things that you might notice if you were sitting and experiencing this full piece is you would see enhanced imagery from actual weather events. And you could, that's what that is in the, the most left side there. Um, in the center, that's a little snippet from, there are um, home movies that are in the public domain that we incorporated into the imagery. Obviously we added some effects to them, but the home movies are running in reverse. And um, that running in reverse is to symbolize our collective way of life at risk of disappearing. You know, like this is this is what we're losing, folks. You know, it's not the polar bears. It's like this, this, these memories, these ways of life that we've gotten used to might not exist for future generations. So in the soundscape, um, you will also hear during this section, uh, local residents recounting memories um, from childhood. These are, uh, we interviewed people and, and um, recorded them. And um, those, we call them uh, voices of remembrance. And um, those voices are a reminder of, again, what's truly at risk if we don't embrace long-term strategies for sustainability. And I think I've got a little mover for this too. Yeah, so here it runs quickly, but it starts with the weather event. You see the movies running backwards. Um, and then it moves on to some other imagery. So this chapter, chapter three, but really the, the piece as a whole ends at like a yet to be determined outcome. So um, it sort of ends in a mystery. In fact, that right uh, image there is one of the last images you see. And it's very hard to tell what this person is doing, what's coming next. So will we allow ourselves to be distracted by ideological debates and short-term material gains, or will we band together and prioritize protecting our future? Um, there is um, a book written by two key architects of the Paris Climate Accord, and there's a quote I love in it that um, 
just, I feel like encapsulates what we were trying to say with this piece, which is our future is still unwritten, but it will be shaped by who we choose to be now. And that is basically the crutch of changing worlds now. So next, I'm going to turn things back to Jenny to walk us through one of her paintings that really served as a key inspiration for this exhibit. Thanks, Karen. So my painting, California Dreamin', focuses on the record wildfires that are happening on the West Coast. And some of you who know me know I moved here years ago um, from California. And my parents and sister and her family still live there. So the wildfires we're seeing really have personal meaning to me. Um, wildfires are a natural part of many ecosystems. So why, why, are, why am I talking about them in an exhibit about climate change? Because climate change is making them worse as our planet warms. California is having its driest air in decades and it's drawing moisture from the vegetation and leaves it ready to burn. In 2020, California had its worst wildfire season on record. And these fires are one of many environmental tragedies that we're seeing that are impacting millions of families. My personal experience with the impact of this climate crisis inspires my work on this exhibit. And there's more to that story about California. In 2015, the Valley wildfire devastated my family's community in Cobb Mountain, California. My parents were on their deck um, on a pretty day and they realized that the flames that they had casually noticed in the distance were headed directly toward them and they had to evacuate. And after days of worrying, they learned that the fire had destroyed their house along with much of the town. And with that, Karen, can you show the next slide? So these images on either side of my painting are what was left of their home. So <laughs> with that said, my painting California Dreamin' and my found object sculpture, What's Left Behind, they're both inspired by this awful experience. Um, California Dreaming is an, uh, acrylic painting, it's hand painted, it has hand painted and monoprinted paper incorporated into it. The burning house on the hill could be so many homes on our west coast and around the world that have been devastated by record wildfires lately. And I tend to embed images in my works um, to be discovered and hopefully to prompt more thought. So if you look to the bottom of the charred hill in the painting, it's in the lower right hand corner. Karen is highlighting it. Um, there's high chairs at the base of the charred hill and they are captured from images that I took of an actual high chair that I pulled out of the trash <laughs> that long ago had lost its purpose and had been cast off. And to me, this high chair symbolizes the future of our children if we don't embrace this turning point. Um, so Karen, next slide, please. I included this actual high chair that I used, uh, that I photographed for the collage imagery on my painting in my found object sculpture called What's Left Behind. And this found object sculpture represents the aftermath of all the wildfires, floods, and storms that are gonna become more and more extreme if we fail to act to address climate change. I often collage photos that I've taken of my earlier works into my new ones. So you'll see if you look at the um, painting, the imagery of a cityscape skyline along the horizon. Um, that's blending images I've taken of paintings I've done in the past, as well as an image of a model that I constructed by taking my collage papers that I create um, and constructing them into a 3D model and then photographing that. Um, there's also, with many of my paintings, I include embed a painting of a headlight. For me, those are warning beacons, giving us pause to think about 
the risks involved in not addressing climate change. The headlight in this particular painting is directly to the right of the large brown vertical looking um, linear building. Um, and it's a bit warped because the paper that it was printed onto is um, contoured to be a part of that model that I created. And probably appropriate given the statement that it's making. Um, finally, I painted the white building with the um, vertical looking column like um, linear elements to loosely resemble the California State Capitol building. And the idea here is that um, supporting policies to, to address our climate change at every level from the local to the federal are the most impact, one of the most impactful things we can do to address climate change. So with that said, back to Karen. Okay, so while we're on the topic of artistic process, this next piece is something of a favorite for both of us because we had such fun creating it. Pioneer 2050 epilogue. So depending on your age on this call, you may or may not remember. But in the early 1970s, the Pioneer 10 and 11 space probes carried graphic plaques, they were attached to the outside of the probes, into space with the hope of encountering extraterrestrials outside of our solar system and introducing them to humankind. So in Pioneer 2050 epilogue, what Jenny and I have done is we've imagined an update carried by a fictitious final probe that might be tasked with concluding our story if we fail to take action and adequately stem climate change. So for those of you who just might not have been a bit as big a science geek as I was, um, or you just don't recall, let's take a quick look at the original plaque. I'll do a little zoom in here. So it might, might now look familiar to some people jogging some memories. So taking a quick tour around the original plaque, and I don't remember every single thing about this, but what you might notice first are two naked people, um, very Caucasian looking, gender binary, male and female. So this was designed by astronomer Carl Sagan with a few other people, and it was edited by NASA. Carl Sagan had originally made those two people very, um, ethnically indistinct and NASA changed them back to look extremely Caucasian. So the male's hand is raised in the hopes that aliens will make the connection that humans have movable limbs. Next to the humans, um, that shape is the outline of the probe itself to provide some context of our body size. Um, that sort of spider web looking thing is a sort of celestial map. So it's kind of a um, fingerprint to a unique pulsar. So if the aliens recognize that pulsar, it could provide context as to the location of our solar system. I think our solar system, I I've, might have indicated it on our, on our one. Uh, and so then our solar system, our runs along the bottom of the plaque. And back then there were nine planets and you can see the little probe and an arrow provided aliens understand arrows, which you would see from which planet that probe originated. And then in the upper right um, is a symbol of hydrogen at some transition point. And that's on there um, because hydrogen atoms are the most abundant element in the universe. So um, here's a QR code and it'll be at the end too, if anyone would like to uh, hear better definitions of all those little symbols, but there are more things embedded there that are pretty cool. So um, back to ours. So um, you'll notice in our Pioneer 2050, um, it contains some of the same graphics, but they've been updated. So let me, let me grab the little zoom tool. So the status of the humans is now represented by an indigenous symbol for no longer living. Um, 
here we have the wavy symbol for heat emanating from that third planet where the probe originated. In the lower left, we're using arrows again to indicate sea level rise. And then in the upper left, the hydrogen atom has been replaced with molecules for carbon dioxide, methane, and nitrous oxide, uh, because those are the primary gases that drive global warming. So why did I say this was a fun process that all sounds like a big downer? But it was really fun because for this work, we truly used an iterative process by which we each took a turn painting the canvas in our own studio before passing it on to the other to continue. And we exchanged the canvas a total of six times. And we had set a rule for ourselves at the outset that we weren't allowed to discuss how it was developing or what direction it should take. We even wired it so that it could hang in multiple directions so one wouldn't influence the other as to which way should be up. And so the very last iteration is when we finally discussed how we should resolve it as a finished piece. And at that point, it was transformed into Pioneer 2050 epilogue. Now, the next painting we're gonna take a quick look at is one of mine. And I just wanna briefly touch on it because again, the rules I set for myself um, before I even started completely drove the outcome. So this is titled Worried and Richer. You can see the text clearly plays a big role in the messaging of this work. So before I ever brought out the piece of paper, the paint for this piece, I was reading an article about the role that climate change played on a recent um, like devastating weather event in another country. And in the article, the high level government official who was being interviewed was asked what changes would be implemented to stem the rate of global warming given this terrible disaster that was underway. And the leader's response was essentially, our focus has always been and will always remain growing our economy. So I was feeling something after reading that article and I started a process um, of altering the article um, by somewhat randomly redacting words. So I was like continually reducing and reducing the amount of text in the article, but I did create rules for myself. So I couldn't leave consecutive words. I, any words that remained, they had to remain in the order that their original order, I couldn't rearrange them for my own needs. So at the end of this process, what I wound up with, the words that were left said, imagine what we'll look like worried and richer. And it kind of blew me away how well and how succinctly that phrase fed back to me, my gut reaction to what I perceived to be risky, even dangerous short-term thinking on the part of that government official. Um, I am a very visual person. Sometimes the words don't come to me. Sometimes they come from elsewhere and I go, yes, that's what I was thinking. So that phrase so perfectly suited what I was feeling that this painting just flowed out of me. And even the treatment of the paint itself came to me so naturally and in a way that I felt really um, suited what I was expressing. This is um, painted with gouache and it was painted using a wooden toothpick um, because somehow that divine phrase that had popped out of that article told me brushes aren't gonna work for what I'm trying to express. Um, and gouache is kind of like a dry paint and it just, the angst I was feeling just was perfect for, for that process. I might like this painting more than anyone else does because I remember the process being such perfect flow once that gold nugget had been revealed. Um, so any creatives out there, 
um, you know, just look for inspiration everywhere. It's not always where you think you're going to find it. So the last set of works that we're going to do a little kind of a deep dive on um, are companion pieces that together encapsulate uh, essentially our hope for this exhibit. So Jenny, I'll, I'll turn it back to you for these. Great, great. Thanks, Karen. So this is what we call the solution station. And it consists of an unassuming desk that we designed. And the idea was to give visitors the opportunity to contribute to collective action right within our exhibit. Um, so they can come to this desk and they can read some of the information associated with the desk, but they can write a letter that supports climate change measures to their U United States senators, so Tom Tillis and Richard Burr, um, and we'll be planning to mail them. So we've had a really resounding response to this. Um, the envelopes are piling up with those letters. Um, and our hope is that as people write these letters, it's going to give them a sense of ownership um, that they had, can take action in this one little way, but maybe they'll carry that forward and perhaps tune into additional opportunities to contribute. Um, and we have this I acted sticker that Molly Hull, gallery director, designed brilliantly uh, with some of our imagery. And as people write those letters, once they're done, we encourage them to take an I acted sticker just as you would if you voted or nowadays if you got a coronavirus or COVID-19 vaccination um, and wear that proudly as you leave the exhibit. And we're hoping that by having that sticker um, affixed to a shirt or, or a jacket, not in this weather, but hopefully that'll lead them to as they're walking and going about their business and run into people that they know to share their thoughts after having viewed the exhibit. So it takes hopefully their impressions and inspirations and ideas um, out into the world a bit more. The painting above the desk is called Hope Springs Eternal. Uh, it's an optimistic painting that our battle against climate change can be won. Um, there's some symbols in it. An iceberg is floating on the horizon. Um, there's a hopeful sunrise illuminating the sky. Um, there are even two figures. I don't often embed figures into my paintings, but the figures are there to show our role in really helping solve this problem that we've, we've contributed to. So that painting is in essence, a message that people can leave with saying there's much that we can do. Every one of us has a part to play in addressing our climate crisis. And our daily choices, like even driving less or consuming less, um, they make a good in individual contribution, but it's also gonna take collective action for us to avoid the worst case possibilities. Um, and you know, one sort of test tube and unfortunate um, experience that we've all been through is the pandemic. Um, and it's shown us that we're capable of taking actions that are science-based and um, that help us to solve major problems. In this case, we've restructured the work world, the educational world, um, and other important activities. Uh, in the case of climate change, um, measures that really come from collective action are gonna be critical to address this climate crisis. So your votes, your letters to policymakers, your conversations, those all make a significant difference. Um, it's good to consider your areas of interest and how you might use them to impact others. And Karen and my work is a, an example of exactly how that can happen. We took our passions, our pursuits, our um, careers to some degree um, and use that as a way to discuss and bring about this message of hope around solving our climate crisis. And really our greatest hope for this exhibit and this talk is that it will help inspire you all to look for ways that you can use your connections and interests and skills to also contribute to solutions to our climate crisis. Um, I'm just thanking, so thankful to all of you for taking this time on a Thursday night. And um, we really appreciate all that Molly and everybody at, uh, at uh, Meredith has done to make this exhibit possible. 
there are those wonderful QR codes that we promised all of you. <laughs> so please do screenshot them. Karen. Uh, yeah, so, so obviously those are all the specific works that we plan to share with you this evening. Um, <clears throat> I did test and taking a screenshot does work for the QR codes if you're interested. Um, so at this point, we would love to open things up for any Q&A or anything you'd like to contribute to the discussion. So feel free to type in the chat. Um, or if you want to raise your electronic hand, we can start opening mics at this point. Um, and if you need to drop off, that's totally fine too. But Jenny and I and Molly will be here for anyone who wants to continue the discussion. So I, I'm driving this bus, so I can't see the chat or the people. So Molly, I know that you're, you're monitoring that. We might have technical difficulties there with the monitoring. Oh, are we? Okay. Well, I didn't hear Molly. Did you? There. Right here. Here she oh, is. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> uh, don't be shy, people. Any questions, any comments? Perfectly fine. Ah. Yuko, she's interested in the process of the original patterns that I'm creating. Wow. Okay. Yuko. Thank you. <laughs> uh, I love that. Well, so I, I use a whole cross section of processes. Um, one I mentioned was that I take parts of photos that I've taken of earlier paintings, and I then take those photos and digitally crop out interesting parts of the painting. So for instance, this sounds a little extreme or bizarre, but um, I painted a series of trucks, um, old vintage trucks from the 1930s. And I took a bunch of photos of those, of course you do for purposes of um, your website, et cetera. And I have taken grills and headlights out of those photos that I took of my trucks and created imaginary cityscapes, imaginary, cityscapes out of those collage elements. So that's an example of one of the processes I use to create original patterns. I could go on and on. Mm -hmm. It'd be a three hour talk instead of a one hour talk, but I appreciate that question. Carol Oloff says, Karen and Jenny, this is a wonderful presentation. I especially love hearing about your collaborative and artistic process. Thank you. And well, thank you, Carol. We're so glad to be able to share it. It's, it's really um, momentum building to work with others. And I strongly encourage anybody who's at this talk, who's feeling a little inspired to look for other people to share that inspiration with. That's I think it's really catalyzed a lot of Karen and my work around this issue for us to work together. Kelly Walsh says, this is so impressive. I love that you give visitors an action step with the letter to Congress, reminds us we can act in ways to help. Yeah, and Kelly and everyone else, I'll also mention the photograph that we used that showed that desk was like pre-exhibit you should see the piles yes. of letters in there. Like why we didn't think to take a current picture, I don't know, yeah. but I walked in the other day and was like, whoa. <laughs> yes, yes, it's going to have some impact to, for, for those to get nailed. Um, they will definitely be well, uh, be received and uh, hopefully acknowledged and maybe make a little bit of a difference there, so. Um. Carson Williams says, this was so lovely. So happy I got to be a part of this call. Oh, thank you so much, Carson. We, we so appreciate you coming. Noelle Pierce said, I loved hearing about the pioneer piece. It's like an art and science puzzle. Thank you. Yeah, we really enjoyed that. It, it's, it's interesting to think about creative ways to get people's attention around this issue. There's so many different people contributing to the conversation. And as artists, we feel like maybe we're giving voice to, to parts of aspects of this um, issue that might not otherwise be heard. And so I think that helps us be inspired. 
Uh, we're not focusing as much on facts and figures, although we certainly are driven by them and refer to them. So um, appreciate that. Um, Janine Murray says, thank you. Your processes are fascinating, especially that of the collaborative work. Thank you from Brian, Evan, and Janine. Thanks, well, Janine. thank you, Brian, Evan, and Jean. You know you're special to both Karen and me. And I know um, I, we all, we both appreciate all of your wisdom and support. Tom and Viv Burnham um, says, so many brilliant ideas and images, especially the updated Pioneer image. Have you made presentations slash shared your exhibit with decision makers like local city councils and commissioners? If so, what was the response? So Molly has done an amazing job with some outreach about this exhibit. Um, and she, she did get some feedback and Molly, I'm sorry, I'm forgetting which organization it is and maybe it doesn't matter, but saying that um, they, it had never occurred to them to take an approach that was not policy, you know, strictly policy or science driven, never occurred to them to approach this through art as just like another prong, another way of coming at it. Yeah, I uh, think people don't really realize that art for centuries has been a way to carry messages. That's mm -hmm. the thing that we need to tell people that art is a way to take action. Thank you, Tom. Exactly. Thank you. Yes, great, great suggestion. Um, Karen Corey says, I love how you weaved your passions and skills combined with the educational value that is important. You're a great team. Young people need to hear and see these. Thank you. Thank you, Karen. Thanks, Karen. Aria says, amazing exhibit storytelling and mission. Um, question about decision making and creating the exhibit. Vision. Did the artists make specific decisions to make the exhibit environmental friendly, for example, by using technology, recycled materials, etc.? Yes, that informs um, so much of much of my work. I, I really seek out opportunities for reuse. Um, I think carefully about the types of materials I use. Um, that are the least toxic, least um, likely to end up contributing to our planet's demise. <laughs> um, so we also my, enjoy shopping at Scrap Exchange <laughs> for scrap supplies. Exchange. In fact, I have an article um, in Artists and Climate Change. It's a it's a vehicle on uh, online um, that is in support or is really referring to client uh, to Scrap Exchange quite a bit. Um, and it's focused on reuse um, and scrap exchange. We're huge fans of scrap exchange. Mm -hmm. We're fortunate as artists because mo many major metropolitan areas don't have anything. Scrap I, I'm hoping everybody is aware. I know there's some art students. Um, thank you for coming art students online. Mm -hmm. um, please, if you get a chance, go over to Durham and spend some time at the scrap exchange. They collect all kinds of items that you might not otherwise have any access to, often stuff that would not go to a thrift store because it wouldn't really sell to your average person that needed clothing or an, a pan or something. But um, for artists and creatives, it's just, it's just an incredible resource. So plan, plan at least an afternoon, bring your friends. Yeah, bring food, <laughs> drinks, they have, sustenance. They have, they have you won't want to leave. <laughs> they have reused uh, shopping carts. They're kind of, they, they creak and they, you know, they're rickety, but they're functional. And I've filled an entire shopping cart more than once. Um, it's almost as bad as Costco, but uh, mm -hmm. yeah, I strongly recommend it. I hope that answers that, that question. Thank you. Um, Ron Sunday says, terrific presentation. Great to see your collaboration continue. Thank you. Thank you, John Sunday. Um, Olivia Christopher says, I'm so, I was so shocked to hear you pass the painting back and forth. I think that is an amazing <laughs> development technique. I so enjoyed viewing this in person and the opportunity to make change with you. Oh, great. That warms my heart. And yes, that is, a, I, I strongly recommend doing that, that exercise or that approach sometime. Find, 
find someone that you trust or don't trust because maybe somebody you don't trust is more fun to do it with because they'll yeah. really disrupt <laughs> they'll really disrupt your work. <laughs> We've but done that also- twice now and I know yeah. um I know there's at least one artist on this call who does that regularly and it's super fun. It's like a game. It's it's, it's really also fun. kind of freeing because you know as artists of course you want to be learn to to draw impeccably and you know all of that but we also have to at a point learn to free ourselves from too many parameters and and expose ourselves to new approaches and i think doing this uh passing iterative process really uh facilitates that in a in an interesting way yeah and you know we mentioned that we had rules that we couldn't discuss we we wired it so that the other person wouldn't even know which way we had hung it and oh my gosh it was just killing us killing us you you'd get it and there was like a million things you wanted to ask and you couldn't and so it was it was just a really fun process yes definitely definitely with amazing results (laughs) um Teresa marie ryan asks have climate change scientists commented on your work Oh, yes, actually, (laughs) definitely. Um, I mean, so Brian Murray is an um, economist who um, is an energy expert, and he's been very generous in giving us his insights about work. But we uh, we have friends um, in environmental law, in um, the um, biology that have focused on issues around climate change. We've made connections with people um, in, in the sciences around other exhibits we've had. So it's it's very valuable. I mean, you don't, I, I, I couldn't do this without having that, those touch points. And of course, just reading voraciously. This, this, I, this exhibit, I viewed everything through that I've read through this lens. And um, it, it's it's been a real opportunity to have a better grasp of the hopeful nature of what we have um, at our disposal to, to solve what we're facing with climate change. So please, everybody, don't be discouraged. Um, read, focus. If you, you know, if you want to use your art, if you're an artist toward that, um, please do. Um, Emily Howard says, "Thanks, Jenny and Karen, for bringing your work to narrative. It has been a source of inspiration for our students, particularly my students in art ethics." Yay! I'm so glad to hear that. And I, I was talking to somebody that was in your class, Emily. It sounds like a fascinating class. I, I wish I'd had a class like that when I was an undergrad. I mean, what a gift. And I'm so glad that um, they're finding, or the students are finding this exhibit to be a good context for exploring much of what you're uh, discussing in class. So thank you for sending those really inspired and interesting students our way. You're so welcome. Um, we really, we used your exhibition several class periods and I think students are really interested in this subject. Um, I've noticed, you know, just getting feedback from students about what they're interested in working on and uh, climate change, the environment, these are all things that are on their mind. And I'll say also, we had a lot of students, there was one evening when we were there and there were quite a lot of students that came that night. We had such amazing conversation. What a great group of people you have on campus. Um, It was really kind of like warmed your heart that these young people are out there. So um, they were a real pleasure. Yeah, I mean, they're gonna be the major source of momentum around this because we're still, you know, we're still, basking in the afterglow of our idyllic childhoods, you know? (laughs) And I think that we're in a little bit of a false sense of complacency, even though, you know, what we're seeing around us, but the youth, the the students, the young people, you guys have, this has been what you've seen (laughs) throughout Mm -hmm. your life. Mm -hmm. So thank you for whatever momentum you, you know, you are supplying to to our society, to to the rest of us. Um, It was, it was, it was really important impactful to talk to you uh, at the reception and other times that I've been in the gallery. Um, Cindy Sundy says the details behind your works are fascinating. Thank you both for sharing them. 
Thank you, Cindy. Much appreciated. Um, Karen Corey asks, how long is this exhibition and, and is running and what are your gallery hours? Oh, great question. Um, I did put on this slide as we were talking, I just wanna highlight this one particular date because we just happen to know that on Saturday, the 25th, both Jenny and I will be at the um, exhibit space from two to five. So if that date works for anybody, that's a great date to come because we can continue the chat. Um, Meredith posts the hours um, and then um, Jenny, those hours that you know you're going to be there, is there any way that other people could see those? I know you sent that out on an invitation, but it, it wasn't like a public thing. Yes. Um, hmm, good question. I wonder if I could put my email in here and people could just email me and um, I could then just send you the hours that I'm going to be there. I can also uh, create an oh, Instagram. I can create an Instagram post. Uh, okay. Oh, that's a great idea. That would be great. If um, the hours that both were either will be there. Great. That's awesome. And thank you, Araya, for first posting the link to the scrap exchange. Yes, thanks, Araya. That's very helpful. Um, I'll go ahead and answer Linda's question. This presentation is recorded and it will be posted on the gallery website and will be archived within the Meredith. Um, college YouTube channel. So there will be many people who will be able to view this gallery talk. Oh, that's great to know. Thank you. It's wonderful. Any other questions? You don't need to necessarily type them in the chat. You're welcome to just interrupt us if you would like. <laughs> Well, a huge, huge thanks for all of you nice people showing up. We were just looking forward to this all day. This is very fun for us. Um, it's been a great conversation. For So thank you for your engagement with our art, but hopefully also around this issue. And yeah. um, for those of you who haven't been able to get to the gallery, it's a f if it's a far drive, no pressure. But if you can make it that date, we would love to see you um, on that date if possible. Yes, and my email is now in the chat stream so that if you want to email me, I'll give you the send you back the hours when I'll be there in addition to those that, that that's one that Karen mentioned. And of course, it'll be on the Instagram from Molly. So thank you again, everybody. It's just been a really great evening. We appreciate all of you so much. And thank you for sharing your thoughts about climate change with your friends and families and whoever you come across. Thank you, Jenny and Karen. And awesome thank evening. you again, Molly. Yeah, thank yes. you. Yes. All right. Good to see you guys. Thank you. Yes, great to see everybody.